Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Are you resisting the devil or assisting the devil? <laughs> That's our subject for the first three meetings, and then I've got going to go a little bit of a different direction with the last one, but they'll all tie in. I'm going to talk to you this weekend about the devil because I feel like God wants me to. <laughs> and you know, for some people, that may not be a very pleasant subject. They think, I don't want to I don't know if I'll come back. I don't want to, you know, I wouldn't talk about the devil. Well, let me tell you something. He's very interested in you. And so maybe you should be just a little more interested in him because he has all these strategies and well thought out plans. And the worst thing that we can do is be uninformed or ignore him. I went to church for many, many years, probably. I don't know, at least 10 years on a regular basis. Dave and I were pretty involved in church and, and I got a really good foundation about salvation, but I have to tell you that after 10 years of being in that church, I never really, I never heard a message about how we can have authority over the enemy, how we need to resist the enemy, we need to rebuke the enemy. Uh, As far as I was concerned, I, I mean, I knew that there was a devil, but I didn't really know that he was the author of my problems. Uh, I didn't know that he was the one that had worked through my father to sexually abuse me when I was growing up. I didn't know that he was the one that made my mother so pathetically afraid that she wouldn't confront the situation and that it ended up costing her her mental health. I blamed things on people Sadly, sometimes even on God, but never really got to the real source of my problems. And the Bible says that we war not against flesh and blood. Now hear me. I know we all think that people are our problems, and, and people certainly can be a problem, but it's the enemy working through people. And so when we just deal with the people, and we never get to the source of the problem, The enemy loves that. We war not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers and wickedness in high places. And we need to learn how to deal with the enemy. I don't think we should go around with the devil on our mind all the time. Uh, but I think that we also have to get stirred up every once in a while to realize that we have to have seasons in our life where we come against him and that we also need to learn how to really recognize when the enemy's at work and to quickly do the same thing that Jesus did, get behind me, Satan. I rebuke you, Satan. You're a liar. Here's the word. If we are passive, it will not stop the devil from being aggressive. You have an enemy. He's not happy that you're making any attempt to serve God. Anytime that you're ready to come up higher, be promoted to a new level in anything, spiritually, financially, anything else. I always say new level, new devil. You always get a little bit of different kind of confrontation on every level that you come up to. And I can be honest and tell you that it's really not even possible for anybody to experience very much success as a believer if you don't understand how to deal with your enemy. Amen. Amen. And so some of you are probably like I was when, when I went to church all those years and, you know, I heard about the goodness of God. But I really didn't even know that the enemy was, that the devil was real. I mean, I just saw the devil as a, I don't know, red pajamas, long tail, pitchfork, <laughs> Halloween character. You know, they sold Halloween costumes. You could dress up like the devil if you wanted to. And, and uh, I, I didn't get it. I didn't really know who he was. And you know, when you're, when you're uninformed and you don't know what you're dealing with, then it's very easy to be defeated. And so we can resist the devil, but if we, if we don't know what we're doing, we can also assist the devil. 
<laughs> and I want to make sure that I'm not doing that and that the people that I have the privilege of teaching are not doing that. So first of all, let's talk for a minute about why does trouble come in our lives? I think we've always got that why question. That's a question that will never stop being asked. So I'll talk to you about three reasons why trouble comes. First of all, we live in a fallen world and we often experience the fruit of just the general curse that's in the, in the world resulting from sin. And so when we have trouble because it's just we're in the world and there's just trouble out there, in the world there will be tribulation, Jesus said. First of all, let me say that those are not really times where you need to try to figure anything out. We waste way too much of our time with the why, God, why. I don't understand. I don't think that's a bad thing to ask God. But if he doesn't show you anything, don't go on a digging expedition trying to make something up. It seems like with Christians, we always want to have a reason for everything. Well, it's because of this. Well, it's because of that. Well, sometimes it's just because you're living in the world. You know, I mean, it's, it's just that simple. Those are times to put our faith in God and to trust him without borders and even sometimes beyond what seems reasonable to protect us to lead us through and ultimately in his perfect timing out of the trouble. How many of you have had great problems in your life at some time and God has led you out of those and you now no longer have those problems? Well, amen. Awesome. God is always faithful. And he does not work on our desired timetable. <laughs> amen. At times, he allows us to stay in trouble long enough for us to learn a lesson. And it may not even be, well, I'm going to teach you a lesson because you're doing this wrong. It may just be something that we need to learn for the future. To be very honest, I believe that many of the things that I've gone through in my life, God could have delivered me from them, but I think instead he took me through them because of what he had called me to do. And when I stand up here and talk to you about different things, he wants me to really know, not only just by the word, but by experience also what I'm talking about. And the Bible says in Psalms that we learn by the word of God and by life's experiences. We learn some things just by studying the word, but somehow when you go through something, I understand the fear that cancer brings because I dealt with that 25 years ago in my life. I understand it being hard to give up the habit of smoking cigarettes because I went through that almost 40 years ago. When you, when you experience something in your life, then you have usually a greater level of compassion. And really, somebody trying to minister to others with no compassion is just, it's not only pretty much useless, but it's just downright aggravating. There's nothing worse than somebody trying to preach a sermon to you when they have zippo idea what you're talking about. Amen? And so some of the things that you go through, you may just be getting experience for your future. And uh, I think that we see, uh, we see also that sometimes God will not deliver us the moment that we'd like to be delivered because he... He wants us to be stable and show a good witness to other people around us. You know, the Bible never says that as Christians, we'll never have problems. Actually, we have some of the same problems that people in the world do, but we handle them differently. We handle them completely differently. So then it's very easy to see where light is and where darkness is. It's very easy to see, well, you know, I get upset all the time every time something doesn't go my way and you seem to be happy and calm all the time. So what, what's going on here? And eventually, like Dave's witness in, in, to me of being peaceful in all situations, it really affected my life. I need, I, it wasn't going to do any good for somebody just to tell me be peaceful because to be honest, I didn't even know what peace was. I grew up in a dysfunctional home that was constantly full of strife and turmoil and anger and violence. So to say to me, you need to be peaceful, it wouldn't have even computed with me at all. But Dave was an example of peace in front of me, and not just for a day or a week, but for a few years. 
And I got hungry for what he had, and I began to see that, well, it, if you can do it, then it must be possible. So how many of you want to be used by God? Okay, well, can I tell you a secret? Sometimes to be used by God, <laughs> well, come on. How many of you still want to be used by God? All right. You better mean what you say because a lot of people's like, well, you know, uh, I want this and I want that. And no wonder Jesus told a couple of guys, you have no idea what you're asking for. Are you ready to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the same baptism for which I'm baptized? Now, it's worth it, but I'm just going to tell you that you got to get experience and you got to get equipment. And so sometimes God doesn't deliver us when we would like him to just because we're getting some experience or because we're being an example to someone else. Let's look at a good example in Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 23. When they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safe. And he, having received so strict of a charge, put them into the inner prison, not just the prison, but the inner prison in the dungeon, and he put their feet into chains. So these guys were not getting away. But about midnight, now, I don't know what time they went into jail, but it wasn't midnight. It was a long time before midnight. But God waited until midnight to do something about their situation. How many of you feel like you're in your midnight hour right now? But about midnight, as Paul and Silas were praying and singing, they stayed happy <laughs> of praise to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Can I tell you that people, prisoners out in the world, are listening to you and they're watching you and they don't just watch you in your happy, sappy, yappy times. They watch you when you have problems to see how you're going to behave. Amen? I love that. The other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the very foundation of the prisons were shaken and at once all the doors were opened and everyone's shackles were unfastened. When the jailer startled out of his sleep saw that the prison doors were open he drew his sword and was on the point of killing himself because he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Then the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling and terrified, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And so he brought them out of the dungeon and said, men, what is it necessary for me to do that I may be saved? <laughs> Come on. And they answered, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, Give yourself up to him. Take yourself out of your own keeping. And boy, what a, great, what a great explanation of what it means to be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Give yourself up to him. Stop trying to take care of yourself and trust God to take care of you. Amen. And you will be saved. And this applies both to you and to your household as well. And now watch this, verse 32 and 3. And they declared the word of the Lord, the doctrine concerning the attainment through Christ of eternal salvation in the kingdom of God to him and to all who were in his household. And he took them the same hour of the night and bathed them because of their bloody wounds. And he was baptized immediately and all the members of his household. I love it. So why did God leave them there till midnight? So somebody could see their witness, see their stability, hear them praising God in a difficult time, and it brought salvation to not only that jailer, but his entire household. Come on, you're, you're being watched. People are watching you. And I can tell you that your bumper sticker and the cross around your neck doesn't impress them. Actually, it will make them watch you more closely. <laughs> so for goodness sakes, if you're going to have all the exterior equipment, make sure you got the life to go along with it. 
Otherwise, get the stuff off until you grow up a little. Second reason why we have trouble is the result of man's disobedience and self-will, either innocently or maliciously. That means that we, we either disobey God out of a lack of knowledge, we don't know what we're doing, or sometimes we just do something foolish, like I did last week when I hurt my back. And then sometimes we know better and we disobey God. And all of those things open doors for the enemy in our life. I have had back issues on and off for lots of years, probably my own fault because I spent years and years marching around on these hard platforms in three-inch spike high heels because I wanted to look good. These knots on the side of my feet turned out to be bunions that hurt all the time. And then I had to have surgery and then I had corns on my toes from wearing these pointy-toed shoes. Come on, women, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, let's get real. Feet were not meant to go in something like that. <laughs> and we were supposed to be walking on our toes all the time, I guess. Anyway, as you can see, I've changed my shoes. But, <laughs> but we can open doors just through our own foolishness. And then another way that we can have problems is through the direct attack of Satan. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And if you are trying to make progress in your walk with God, I have to tell you ahead of time that he will try to stop you. Thank you for your enthusiasm. <laughs> I mean, I'd love to say he's going to roll out the red carpet and say, welcome into the kingdom of God, but that's not going to be that way. But let me tell you something, at least that's a problem you can handle because now you'll have a new friend that knows how to help you come against the enemy. If you stay out there and try to do it on your own, you're done in before you ever get started. I don't have time to go to all these scriptures, but in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10, 11, and 12, and you know, when Jesus says something once, it's important, but when he says the same things two verses in a row, man, I think we need to really listen. And it says that blessed are you when, not if, when you are persecuted for righteousness sake, for doing the right thing. <laughs> then again it says, blessed are you when people say all kinds of evil things against you falsely on my account. Now, one of the, one of the worst kinds of pains I think that we can have is when we're trying to do right and people that we love come against us. I mean, you don't want anybody coming against you, but when it's people that you love, it's really tough. So when God called me to do what I'm doing now, and actually I didn't know yet he was calling me, I just had a real touch from God in my life and was really excited, and I felt like he wanted me to teach the Word, and I started teaching a Bible study in my home. I didn't know what I was doing, but, you know, I learned by experience. And I lost all my friends, got asked to leave my church. Well, I didn't understand that. It's like, yeah, God, I don't understand. I'm just trying to do the right thing. I'm just trying to be obedient to you. Well, see, I wish that I would have had somebody then that could have sat down and told me what I'm telling you here. Somebody could have just said, oh, honey, you know, don't worry about it. You'll get through this. It's just the enemy trying to stop you. You just go ahead and obey God. But I had to kind of go through that myself and figure out a lot of these things just by studying the Word of God. But I'm just telling you that if, if you... When you pray for God to promote you in some area of life, don't think that you're not going to have to stand your ground, because you will. And then the next verse says, great is your reward. I love that. Verse 10, you're going to get persecuted. Verse 12, people are going to talk about you in an evil way. Verse 13, you're going to get a reward. And see, a lot of people don't ever stick around long enough to get the reward. They give up when it gets hard, and they either completely backslide or they begin to compromise and live with one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom because you don't want people to think you're a Jesus nut or a Jesus freak. Come on. 
I am too, brother. Don't plan to change. Hey, I love Jesus. He is my life, and I want everybody to know it. Now, let's have a little bit of background on Satan. He was formerly called Lucifer, was created by God as an angel with free will. He was an archangel, and archangels are a high order of angels with great power and responsibility. Now, let's look at Ezekiel chapter 28, beginning in verse 13. Oh, my goodness, I've already found my place. God is with me. <laughs> I've been redeemed. <laughs> you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The carmelian, the topaz, the jasper, the chrysolite, the beryl, the onyx, sapphires, carbuncles, and emeralds. Now, he was covered with all these jewels. And your settings and your sockets... Another translation says your tabrets and your pipes, which are actually musical instruments, and engravings were wrought in gold. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. So God made all of those amazing gemstones that's mentioned here for Lucifer. <laughs> you were the anointed cherub that covers with overshadowing wings, and I set you so. You were upon the holy mountain of God. You walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire like the paved work of the gleaming sapphire stone upon which the God of Israel walked on Mount Sinai. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity and guilt were found in you. And through the abundance of your commerce, you were filled with lawlessness and violence, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you out as a profane thing from the mountain of God. Wow. A little more background. All the experts don't agree, but many believe that Satan was in charge of worship and that his body actually had musical instruments in it. So what we see him do was even especially despicable in light of the beauty that God had given him, the power that God had given him, the position God had given him, the closeness that he had with God, and now watch what happens. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How are you fallen from heaven, O light bringer and day star, son of the morning? Those were his names before. How have you been cut down to the ground, O you who weakened and laid low the nations, O blasphemous satanic king of Babylon? And you who said in your heart, now, I want you to watch this because in two verses, he makes the statement, I will, five times. He had free will. And this is what he used his will for. I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of assembly in the uttermost north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Ooh. Here's God's answer to that. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to Hades, to the innermost recesses of the pit, the region of the dead. So when Satan fell, was kicked out of heaven, other scriptures tell us that he took a third of the angels with him, and therefore we have the devil and his demonic hosts who now not only have residence in Hades and the lower region of the earth, but also they can walk the earth and they occupy the space, the atmosphere above the earth. Now, I know some of you probably think this is just super creepy <laughs> because you have never heard maybe anything like this. Well, you know what? I felt like that God wanted me to make sure as a teacher that you knew that the devil is alive and well on this planet and that he is the root cause of your problems and your trouble and that you have to learn how, you have to learn who you are in Christ, the authority and the power that you have, and you must begin to exercise it because authority is useless if you do not exercise it. And we cannot be lazy Christians and expect the devil not to walk all over us.
Well, we need to learn to recognize the enemy at his onset. That is the moment he tries to gain entry into our lives. We need to be ready to come against him with the power and authority that God has given us. James 4, 7 says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, stand firm against him, and he will flee from you. Today, we are having a medical camp on behalf of Joyce Mayer Ministries. It's a big event for the village people so that they can receive medication and the love of Christ. That's what is happening here right now. There are so many instances where people who have come here, they've been suffering from those diseases or infections from quite a long, but they never go to a medical help because they don't have a finance even for travel. People are quite receptive to us because they are seeing that we are helping them beyond just sharing the gospel. And you know. This event has been uh, being planned in our minds and hearts for the past two, three months. So the church in Hyderabad is praying and the village church has been praying continuously. And that's what we are seeing that God's grace, everything is going on smoothly. <laughs> Thank you very much for your contribution to India and because of your help, Yo, we are you making us to go every corner, looking every place. And without your support, we cannot go. Met deze mobiele kliniek geven we bij Hand of Hope elke maand nieuwe hoop aan duizenden mensen. Hier krijgen de patiënten alles op één plek: van oogtesten tot röntgenfoto's, tot het verstrekken van medicatie. En dat allemaal dankzij de vele donateurs die dit werk steunen. Wilt u meehelpen de wereld te veranderen? Word dan onze partner en doneer regelmatig. Wij sturen u graag kostenloos onze brochure toe. Vraag deze aan door te bellen naar 026 20 22 100 of ga naar joyce-meyer.nl slash partner. ontdekt de beste quotes van Joyce. Nu op Facebook.